Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. So I think this was his first novel, I may be wrong, it's definitely an early novel of his. Um, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say there are two movies based on this, so I watched both of those after reading this as well, and they were both pretty good. Uh, the newer one has got the guy who played Captain Holt in uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine in it, so that might interest you, I don't know. Um, yeah, they were both worth watching, book was worth reading. There we go, review done. Dane reads... Here's the blurb, okay. Five prominent biophysicists gave the United States government an urgent warning. Sterilization procedures for returning space probes may be inadequate to guarantee uncontaminated re-entry to the atmosphere. Two years later, Project Scoop sent 17 satellites into the fringes of space in order to collect organisms and dust for study. Then a probe satellite falls to the Earth, landing in a desolate area of northeastern Arizona. In the nearby town of Piedmont, bodies lie heaped and flung across the ground, faces locked in frozen surprise. The terror has begun. So let's check out some tabs. So we'll start here with day one, contact. So I like this, this little bit here defines what a crisis is. According to Lewis Bornheim, a crisis is a situation in which a previously tolerable set of circumstances is suddenly, by the addition of another factor, rendered wholly intolerable. Whether the additional factor is political, economic or scientific hardly matters. The death of a national hero, the instability of prices or a technological discovery can all set events in motion. In this sense, Gladstone was right. All crises are the same. We get a little bit of binary included in here as well. It's almost like a little bit of binary puzzle, puzzle solving. Uh, and he notes, a mathematician once joked that binary numbers were the way people who have only two fingers count. And here's like an excerpt from a scientific paper where basically the, the uh, writer's arguing that if we do find extraterrestrial life, it's probably gonna be uh, unicellular, unicellular organisms or less. So naked genetic information. That has a probability of 0.784 with the possibility of it being uh, like a human level of intelligence, 0. 0.0002. So he says, I must conclude that the first contact with extraterrestrial life will be determined by the known probabilities of speciation. It is an undeniable fact that complex organisms are rare on Earth, while simple organisms flourish in abundance. There are millions of species of bacteria and thousands of species of insects. There are only a few species of primates and only four of great apes. There is but one species of man. And this is in uh, the day two section. We learn, we learn about the different characters. So Lever, he has this ingrained pessimism which had never deserted him. And then he puts in brackets. Lever had once said, at my wedding, all I could think of was how much alimony should cost me. That is pessimistic, isn't it? We get some cool stuff like this as well. So this is like a similar, like a version or representation of a computer printout. And this was just interesting as well. I, you know, I assume this is true. Even if you slit a man's throat with a razor, Burton said, you won't get death that rapidly. Cutting both carotids and jugglers still allows 10 to 40 seconds before unconsciousness and nearly a minute before death. At Piedmont, it seems to have occurred in a second or two. Uh, there's a great line as well. Perhaps the fact that we bleed to death makes us human. And we get some, a bunch of people killed themselves in strange ways. So I'm gonna read these out because I think these are all quite interesting. The old, an old woman, her hair white, her face creased. She was smiling gently as she swung from a noose tied to a ceiling rafter. The rope creaked as it rubbed against the wood of the rafter. At her feet was an envelope, in a careful, neat, unhurried hand, to whom it may concern. Stone opened the letter and read it. The day of judgment is at hand. The earth and the waters shall open up and mankind shall be consumed. May God have mercy on my soul and upon those who have shown mercy to me. To hell with the others. Amen. Burton listened as the letter was read. Crazy old lady, he said, senile dementia. She saw everyone around her dying and she went nuts and killed herself. Yes, I think so. Pretty bizarre way to kill herself, don't you think? That kid also chose a bizarre way, Burton said. Roy O. Thompson, who lived alone. From his greasy coveralls, they assumed he ran the town gas station. Roy had apparently filled his bathtub with water, then knelt down, stuck his head in and held it there until he died. When they found him, his body was rigid, holding himself under the surface of the water. There was no one else around and no sign of struggle. Impossible, Stone said. No one can commit suicide that way. Lydia Everett, a seamstress in the town who had quietly gone out to the backyard, sat in a chair, poured gasoline over herself and struck a match. Next to the remains of her body, they found the scorched gasoline can. William Arnold, a man of 60, sitting stiffly in a chair in the living room, wearing his World War I uniform. He had been a captain in that war and he had become a captain again, briefly, before he shot himself through the right temple with a Colt 45. There was no blood in the room where they found him. He appeared almost ludicrous, sitting there with a clean, dry hole in his head. A tape recorder stood alongside him, his left hand resting on the case. Burton looked at Stone questioningly, then turned it on. A, qu a quavering, irritable voice spoke to them. 
You took your sweet time coming, didn't you? Still, I am glad you have arrived at last. We are in need of reinforcements. I tell you, it has been one hell of a battle against the Hun. Lost 40% last night going over the top, and two of our officers are out with a rot. Not going well, not at all. If only Gary Cooper was here. We need men like that, the men who made America strong. I can't tell you how much it means to me with those giants out there and the flying saucers. Now they're burning us down and the gas is coming. You can see them die and we don't have gas masks, none at all. But I won't wait for it. I'm going to do the proper thing now. I regret that I have but one life to kill for my country. The tape ran on, but it was silent. Burton turned it off. Crazy, he said. Stark raving mad. Stone nodded. Some of them died instantly and the others went quietly nuts. But we seem to come back to the same basic question. Why? What was the difference? And they made a guy called Peter Jackson and that obviously just made me think of the director. Pretty sure it wasn't him though. And this was interesting. I don't know if this is true. It's quite sad as well. Not very vegan. These are army trained sentry dogs, the security man said. Bred for viciousness. You wear leather clothes and heavy gloves when you walk them. They've undergone laryngectomies, which is why you can't hear them. Silent and vicious. So we're going to move on to day number three. And this is about animal testing, which again, not very vegan. Wildfire was prepared to conduct experiments with monkeys and apes, as well as smaller, cheaper animals. A monkey was exceedingly difficult to work with. The little primates were hostile, quick, intelligent. Among scientists, the New World monkeys, with their prehensile tails, were considered particularly trying. Many scientists had engaged three or four lab assistants to hold down a monkey while he administered an injection, only to have the prehensile tail whip up, grasp the syringe and fling it across the room. The theory behind primate experimentation was that these animals were closer biologically to man. In the 1950s, several laboratories even attempted experiments on gorillas, going to great trouble and expense to work with these seemingly most human of animals. However, by 1960 it had been demonstrated that of the apes, the chimpanzee was biochemically more like man than the gorilla. On the basis of similarity to man, the choice of laboratory animals is often surprising. For example, the hamster is preferred for immunological and cancer studies since his responses are so similar to man's, while for studies of the heart and circulation, the pig is considered most like man. And again, some interesting stuff here, which I assume is true. Uh, so a plane has crashed, and uh, we get, he lit his pipe and sucked on it considering the possibilities. Overwhelming was the likelihood that some green trainee had daydreamed, gone off his flight plan, panicked and lost control of the plane. It had happened before hundreds of times. The post team, a group of specialists who went out to the site of the wreckage to investigate all crashes, usually returned a verdict of agnogenic systems failure. It was military double talk for crash of unknown cause. It did not distinguish between mechanical failure and pilot failure, but it was known that most systems failures were pilot failures. A man could not afford to daydream when he was running a complex machine at 2,000 miles an hour. The proof lay in the statistics. Though only 9% of flights occurred after the pilot had taken a leave or weekend pass, these flights accounted for 27% of casualties. And um, I just thought, again, this is an interesting little line. In his blackest hours, Stone doubted the utility of all thought and all intelligence. There were times when he envied the laboratory rats he worked with. Their brains were so simple. Certainly they did not have the intelligence to destroy themselves. That was a peculiar invention of man. And my final tab here is in day four, spread. And uh, this is one of the potential explanations of what could be happening here. Let's say a culture wishes to scan the universe, he said. Let us say they wish to have a sort of coming out party on a galactic scale to formally announce their existence. They wish to spew out information, clues to their existence in every direction. What is the best way to do this? Radio? Hardly. Radio is too slow, too expensive, and it decays too rapidly. Strong signals weaken within a few billion miles. TV is even worse. Light rays are fantastically expensive to generate. Even if one learned a way to detonate whole stars, to explode a sun as a kind of signal, it would be too costly. Besides expense, all these methods suffer the traditional drawback to any radiation, namely decreasing strength with distance. A light bulb may be unbearably bright at 10 feet, it may be powerful at 1000 feet, it may be visible at 10 miles, but at a million miles it is completely obscure because radiant energy decreases according to the fourth power of the radius, a simple unbeatable law of physics. So you do not use physics to carry your signal, you use biology. You create a communication system that does not diminish with distance, but rather remains as powerful a million miles away as it was at the source. In short, you devise an organism to carry your message. The organism would be self-replicating, cheap, and could be produced in fantastic numbers. For a few dollars, you could produce trillions of them and send them off in all directions into space. There would be tough, hardy bugs, able to withstand the rigors of space, and they would grow and duplicate and divide. Within a few years, there would be countless numbers of these in the galaxy, speeding in all directions, waiting to contact life. And when they did, each single organism would carry the potential to develop into a full organ or a full organism. They would, upon contacting life, 
begin to grow into a complete communicating mechanism. It is like spewing out a billion brain cells, each capable of regrowing a complete brain under the proper circumstances. The newly grown brain would then speak to the new culture, informing of the presence of the other and announcing ways in which contact might be made. So yeah, that's about all I have to share about this one. Obviously, I don't want to include major spoilers as well. Um, it is a pretty old book by now, but it, it's still kind of relevant. I mean, some of the science is a bit dated, some of the computer stuff is a bit dated, but the ideas are pretty sound and it was an interesting little read. There were points at which it was a bit slower um, and I wasn't enjoying it quite as much, but I am still glad I read it overall. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. As always, don't forget to let me know what your thoughts are in the comments if you've read this book. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.